Hi, I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. Today, we raised the policy interest rate by 50 basis points to three and three quarters percent. This is the sixth consecutive increase since March. That's Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem announcing on Wednesday yet another interest rate hike. These increases have big effects on everything from mortgage rates to personal savings. So we decided to talk to three personal finance experts about what this all means specifically for young people and what they should be doing with their money. We spoke live on Twitter, and today we're bringing you part of that conversation. This is The Decibel. Hi there, everyone. Uh, Welcome to our Globe and Mail Twitter space. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about the Bank of Canada interest rate announcement uh, and specifically what young people should be thinking about. Uh, Joining me today, we've got Rob Carrick, a personal finance columnist at The Globe. We've got Erica Alini. She's a personal finance reporter at The Globe. And we've got Melissa Leong, who is a financial expert and speaker. Uh, Rob, let me let me ask you a question here. Should we expect more hikes to come? Tiff Macklem said it is likely. You know, how high how high could this actually get? Well, I think we're not at the peak yet, but we are probably one or two rate hikes away from it. So if you're wondering how much more pain is to come, I would say we've had 95% of it with possibly 5% more to come. Hmm. Okay. Um, getting a fixed rate mortgage versus a variable rate mortgage, Erica, is, is one better than the other in, in this current environment? So the short answer is that uh, they're both bad deals right now. <laughs> oh, no. They're both uh, very expensive. Borrowing is is the most expensive it's been in in years and and years. So there are several um, uh, considerations. So with uh, fixed rates, uh, what you are buying is basically uh, peace of mind. Uh, so you, you don't have to worry about what the Bank of Canada does. Uh, you're locked in for, for the length of the term. Uh, with uh, variable rates, um, the interest rates um, adjusts based uh, on um, a benchmark that's called the, the prime rate uh, mm. that the banks, the lender sets. But that, that benchmark uh, is linked uh, to the Bank of Canada's key rate. No one, you know, if you go back in in the spring um, of of this year, no one expected interest rates to rise this much and this quickly. And this has really caught a lot of borrowers um, off guard. Um, Now, going forward, if we are close to the peak, uh, going with a variable rate mortgage uh, means that, you know, you have a good chance of eventually writing the rates down. Um, you know, if uh, if inflation um, comes down and the Bank of Canada expects it to return to the usual sort of uh, 2% range uh, by um, the end of 2024, uh, you know, then it's, it's very likely that we'll see interest rates come down as well. And so even if it's quite expensive um, right now, like the, the the rates are in sort of the 5 6% range, um, you, you get a variable and then maybe mm-hmm. you will see a significant reduction in your interest rate during the course of um, your long term. Hmm. Uh, Rob, I, I, I want to turn to you. We have some listener questions um, talking about housing. So I want to I want to ask you this question. Uh, so somebody sent in, we finally have enough for a down payment for a Toronto house around one point one million. Uh, so much talk of falling prices to come and rising rates. Should we hold off another six months or so? So, Rob, sh- should they wait to buy? You know, I, it's a tough question to ask because, you um, I think we have a tendency to sort of continually underestimate the strength of Toronto housing. So it's going down now, yes, and people are talking about a possible crash. But I, I take a look at all the immigration that's that's scheduled to come into the country and the fact that there is this latent demand. And I wonder if the, the bottom is going to be like a trampoline and we're going to hit it and then bounce higher. So I wouldn't be too careful about picking the bottom point for housing. I would find a moment now or in the next little while where you think I can afford the house that I want. And if you can, buy. Stop trying to time the bottom because you may miss it and end up paying more. 
Good. That's interesting to hear. Uh, Melissa, I'm going to throw this one to you. This is another listener question that we got in. Uh, My fixed rate mortgage has two years left. Should I prioritize paying down my principal the next years or invest elsewhere with extra cash? First time homeowner and manageable monthly payments right now with some surplus to save. So, Melissa, what are your thoughts on that? This is always the uh, age old question for people. Should I invest or should I uh, sort of invest in the market or should I invest in property? Um, and it, sometimes it's a personal, uh, personal finance is personal. So it's a personal question. You know, what do you feel most comfortable with? Um, my husband has always felt more comfortable with paying down a mortgage because he hates debt and the uh, asset makes him feel more comfortable versus the market, even though historically, People who had taken their savings and put it into the market had done better. But it's hard to say what's going to happen if we're approaching um, recession time, what's going to happen in the market. That's a hard question to answer. Hmm. Okay, so it's personal finance is personal. That's that's a good line to remember, I guess, too. It's it's what you want to handle and what you don't want to stress over then. Uh, Rob, we have another listener question I'm going to give to you. Uh, the question is, how long will it actually take for the rate hikes to affect home prices? Well, they're already affecting home prices. We're down. We're way down from the uh, from peak levels, and um, you know, I think we could go down a little bit further. Um, but remember that people want houses in Canada and as soon as they get a little bit more affordable, um, either because prices come down more or because uh, interest rates start to uh, come down a little bit, they're going to jump back in again. So um, I think we we've seen a lot of the effect of high rates on prices already. There could be more, uh, but the question is how much more. Hmm. Okay. I want to kind of move on to the topic of where where to put your money. So especially when times are, are tight like tight like this, when we, we see lots of um, rising inflation, things are costing a lot. Uh, Erica, I, I want to put this question to you because I think people may be weighing the options of what they could do with their money if they have a little bit of extra money. It's, could they you know, put it in savings? Should they pay down their debt? Should they invest it? Uh, of those three options, Erica, what what should someone be prioritizing to do first? So I was just thinking, okay, so if I was, say, you know, uh, s- straight out of school, uh, got my my first job, what would be my my priorities right now? And so I would say, number one, if I uh, didn't already have an emergency fund, uh, I would start to build a minimal uh, emerg- emergency fund. And so at least one month of rent. Uh, or uh, one month of housing expenses, so mortgage plus uh, property taxes plus utilities. That's an absolute bare minimum. I would put all of my cash towards that at first. Mm. Uh, then so I sa- would saving essentially. Then right, saving up for an emergency fund. Then saving saving up for an emergency. Uh, mm. Then uh, if I had um, variable um, d- expensive debt uh, with um, a variable interest rate, so if I had a big balance uh, on a line of credit, um, or I have to say, if I had a fixed rate mortgage that was coming up for renewal in the next few months, that is a looming um, payment shock for a lot of people. Uh, is if you if you bought your house in the past five years and you haven't made much of a dent uh, in your in your principal and you have a fixed rate and your mortgage is coming up for renewal, your your payments um, when at renewal are very likely going to increase and increase significantly. So I would talk to my lender, try to get an idea of exactly what that increase might look like and uh, start to uh, save up, make, maybe make a lump sum payment towards uh, the principal, rearrange my finances so that I am ready uh, for that payment shock that's coming down the line. Hmm. And then and then finally, you know, if I if I still had uh, some resources, I would further boost my emergency fund and try to get to at least three months of living expenses uh, set aside in cash in a high interest savings account. And then finally, if I still had uh, more wiggle room in my budget, um, I would definitely, you know, save and and invest. So, you know, the yes, the the financial markets uh, are. Uh, it's not a pretty picture right now, but remember that you know, if you start investing um, in a downturn in a bear market, and you have that much more room uh, for growth. Hmm, okay, uh, Rob, I, I know you've actually written about this before too. W- from from your perspective, what is what is the gold standard of of how much you you should be saving? Well, the. Um 
you know, there used to be this idea of ta- saving 10% of your pay, but was that 10% of uh, take home pay or 10% of gross pay? So if you were saving 10% of gross, that was sort of the silver saver award. But uh, some people say you should be saving more now because there's more uncertainty, we're living longer, all that sort of thing. But, you know, setting these rules out just makes people feel like failures if they can't match up. So I would say start saving with something and build up to it. And if you could save 10% of your take home, then you're doing very well as a, as a, as a first stage. Hmm. Uh, Melissa, what about people who say, you know what, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of get, get by these days. I can only square away a little bit. Is, is, is a little bit enough at a time like this? Or would you, would you not bother saving if it can only be a little bit at a time? I really appreciated what Rob just said about these rules of thumb making you feel like a failure. Um, Mm -hmm. something that we often talk about, especially as women and women of color, you sort of have these benchmarks and then people tell you actually you should be saving more because, um, you may take time away from work to raise children, which will affect your income. So you should be, um, more aggressively saving and it's all this pressure. And as you said, right now that there are a lot of drains on a lot of young people, whether that be student debt, whether that be the cost of homes and everything that's happening with rising prices and inflation. And so I do think given all of that, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. But the idea of saving is, I cannot stress the importance of it enough, even if it is just a little bit, even if you can automate a small amount and have set a calendar reminder in two months to bump it up, especially if you don't notice it. Any kind of savings for planned spending, any kind of savings for an emergency fund is super important on top of all the things that we talked about, including debt repayment and tackling some of your high interest credit card debt. But Mm -hmm. um, just flexing that muscle, no matter what is happening, is something that you will never, never regret. We'll be right back. We've got another listener question here. Uh, I think we'll we'll, we'll give this one back to you, Rob. Um, Can we go over some of the major do's and don'ts specifically on savings for young adults just entering the real world during a slowing economy, during a slowing economy? One of my biggest fears is mismanaging my money and then turning 40, telling myself, I wish I had known X during inflation or or during this recession. So, Rob, what what are some of the key things, I guess, the, you know, maybe one or two of the major do's or don'ts in, in this economic environment? Okay, one thing I would say is do take your savings and that's money you have to keep perfectly safe and you may need it in the short term, it may be for a longer term goal, has to be in a high rate uh, savings account right now. You can get between 2 and 3%. I think there's one Ontario Credit Union that's up at 3.5%. Get a maximum return. There's a don't attached to this. Don't leave your money in a big bank savings account because they're paying next to nothing right now. And think in terms of having your savings that are for emergencies in the short term and then investing for the long term. That's five or 10 plus years. You want to be adding to both buckets. Hmm, okay. Uh, I want to take a little bit of time to turn to the job market for, for a moment here, because I think one of the things that may be seen as a positive is that even with the worries of a recession, the job market is is, is strong in Canada right now. Melissa, I, I want to ask you specifically about women, because you, you brought this up just a few minutes ago. Uh, and especially during the pandemic, we heard about the she session, women being impacted uh, a lot harder in some ways. I, I wonder, do you have any specific advice for, for women in, in today's labor market? You know, so much great stuff has been said about just before moving, adjusting your own emergency fund. So, so many things are outside of your control, but one thing you can control is how you weather the storm by how much money you have in, uh, you know, a stash of cash in an accessible place in a high interest savings account somewhere. Yes, I know three to six months sounds like a lot, but I cannot tell you how many times my own emergency fund has floated me through so many tumultuous things in my life, including job loss multiple times uh, Mm. being in journalism. And so that's one thing I would say for anyone, not just women. Um, I I also think that there are other ways to be resilient. Uh, Some of those for a young person is also just getting an idea of what other opportunities are going to be available to you at any time. That could mean, yes, looking at other passions that you are interested in. Maybe there's a side hustle that you can also... um, take on to help you build some extra cash for that emergency fund or something that could float you through a period. Um, You know, whether you have opportunities from anything, can you move back in with your parents for a short period of time? Can you Airbnb a property and anything um, uh, just to give you a a possible plan B that will give you a little bit more 
peace of mind. Hmm. Yeah. And and this actually, this is kind of relates to a listener question that we're getting here, too. The question is, tell, tell me, how can you save anything in this current environment with a family of four? I mean, Melissa, any I guess any advice for people who sounds like, you know, are feeling a little overwhelmed in, in this economic reality? I am from a family of four and my children <laughs> eat, they, they eat giant, giant sized meals. My grocery bill is, is wild. And so during this time for myself, um, often when it comes to money, we can get stressed out about it. And when we get stressed, we kind of move away. We, we bury our heads in the sand. We just plug our ear, la la la. You know, it's just, sometimes it's easier not to look, but I promise that clarity brings comfort. So if you find that you feel so squeezed, you're not sure where to look, um, one of the things you can do is look at your own accounts, the inflow and outflow of your money and see where there is any wiggle room. If there is, if you categorize your expenses by looking through your bank statements over the last month or two, uh, and you can see where you can cut. Discretionary is obviously the easiest place to cut, but then also look at your fixed expenses. Can you make a point of calling all of your service providers? At the end of this week, I just switched service providers for my mobile phone last week because I'm constantly doing that, always trying to look for a better deal and then allocating those savings directly to something that's important, another priority. Um, and then just getting really innovative with that, looking for help. Um, are there grants that you can apply for? Um, is there government money waiting for you somewhere? Can you log into the CRA website and see if there's uncashed checks? You know, there are ways to try to cut and ways to save, but it does require a little bit more work, a little bit more shopping around, a little bit more downloading of the apps and seeing if you can price compare using something like Flip. It does take time. Flip. What 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 app is that, uh, Melissa? Flip is a an aggregator, a flyer aggregator. So F L I P P. Uh, it basically pulls in all of the flyers from around your neighborhood according to your your um, uh, postal code, and then that way you can price compare if you're shopping around, if you're looking for things, and you can bring that app into some stores and uh, get instant savings if they do price matching. Hmm. Okay. Good, good tip. I like that. Uh, Rob, uh, what about you? Any tips on, on what to cut back on in, in this time of high inflation? W what would you suggest looking at? Well, you know, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about the economy right now is as much as we're talking about financial stress, there's a lot of spending going on. There's a lot of people in restaurants and traveling and doing fun stuff that they couldn't do during the pandemic. And I'm wondering if it's time to sort of, uh, us all to sort of curb the celebrating a little bit and try to maybe just ratchet down our lifestyles just a little bit if we've been making up for lost time in the pandemic. Uh, you know, sort of that celebratory period was the summer. It's getting turning into winter. Maybe that'll be a um, maybe that'll be a good opportunity for us to sort of think twice about the extravagances that we've been allowing ourselves lately. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I, I want to get in a, a few more things here. Um, Erica, I, I do want to ask you, uh, and then maybe we'll, we'll bring this to, to, to Rob as well. Uh, I, I want to ask about investing. We've, we, you mentioned investing, Erica, when you, we were talking a little bit earlier. But I, I wonder, if someone does want to start investing, maybe for the very first time, is, is now the right environment to, to jump into that? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a question that I had. <laughs> I just had to tackle uh, mm -hmm. earlier this week. Someone else uh, asked me, and it is a tricky question because as a as a beginner, um, it can be gut wrenching to jump in and immediately see your balance shrink uh, because you know stocks are going down, bonds are going down. With we're in this in this. Uh, funny uh, situation right now where we've seen both stocks and bond uh, prices uh, drop, which is extremely uh, rare. On the other hand, uh, if you are investing for the long term, if you're investing for something that's far away, um, like retirement, and if you have a good grasp of investing basics, and you have, you know, a well built portfolio, uh, you know, you're diversified um, across, uh, you know, companies, industries, uh, countries, um, then, you know, investing uh, when the market is down is, is a good time to invest. Hmm. Uh, Rob, what, what about you here? Is, is this, uh, if someone wants to start investing, what, what advice would you give them here? 
jump right in. Now's the time to get going. You're buying low. You know what? Long-term investing success depends on participating in the market, putting money in often on a systematic way. Every time you get paid is a really good way to do it. Um, but you know what? What you put in now, five years from now, will look very good. Um, I'm in no way uh, confident that we're through all the worst of it. There will be backstepping. But as Erica mentioned, stocks are down, bonds are down. You could buy yourself an asset allocation ETF. That's a fully diversified portfolio in a single package. Um, it's been pretty hard hard hit this year. I think buying at that reduced level is a really good move for future investing success. Don't don't avoid investing because, oh, the markets are down. That looks dangerous. That's part and parcel of investing. If you get in when the worst of the downturn has happened, you really position yourself well for the rebound, which will come at some point. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Melissa, I'm, I'm going to turn this to you just, just at the end here. Oh, yes. What's one key thing that uh, you would tell somebody? So somebody who's, who's a young person in, in this economic time, what should they do with their finances right now, uh, especially if maybe they're feeling a little bit anxious about, about this, this economically difficult situation we're in? When I was young, I felt like I was just so behind. I had so many expenses. I didn't make enough money and I, my job prospects didn't seem promising. Um, but the one thing that I tried to do that has changed my life time and time again that has helped me weather so many storms is I did automate a small amount of my savings for the future. And to Rob's point, I automated them for two things. One of them for, was for a rainy day so that I could build up that fund. And the other one was for more a more long-term thing. At first, I thought it was uh, buying a home, but it turned out to be my retirement fund, which, mm -hmm. you know, years later, I look back at these two two things that didn't take that much time and it wasn't a lot of money. It was just a little bit at that time and I just kept bumping it up. Those two things ha have changed my life. Hmm. Okay. Um, Erica, Erica, what about you? What's the, the one key thing that, that you would tell somebody right now? One thing that I would point out is that the job market is still pretty strong right now. And so if you're really feeling like you've looked everywhere in your budget and you have nowhere else to cut and you're still feeling squeezed, this is one of those times where I would say, see if you can maybe bump up your income by pick, you know, taking up, uh, you know, a side gig. I'm not a huge proponent of uh, having two jobs in perpetuity. I think that's a sign that you need to find a better paying job. But for short term goals, such as really building up your emergency fund uh, quickly, uh, then a side gig can really help you. Hmm, yeah. Uh, Rob, I'll throw it to you here last. What is the, the one key thing that you would you would tell someone? You know what? I think we've had a lot of good suggestions. So what I'm going to add to the list is don't beat yourself up if you're not where you think you should be. You know, uh, young people today are going to live extra long lifespans, are going to be working in the workforce quite a bit longer than previous generations. There is a lot of time to get your finances straight, to get into the housing market, to get your investments straight, to build up retirement assets. Take it slow. Take some positive steps. Start with savings. Start with a little investing. But don't, don't get, uh, don't lose your motivation if you think, I'm not where I want to be. Why would I even continue to do anything? Hmm. You know what? That's a, a good positive note to end on there. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, you know, we'll wrap up our conversation here. Uh, thank you so much to, to our three guests. We had Melissa Leong, financial expert and speaker, um, Erica Alini, personal finance reporter here at The Globe, and Rob Carrick, uh, our personal finance columnist. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman Wilms. Our producers are Madeline White, Cheryl Sutherland, and Rachel Levy McLaughlin. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.